Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, AP Bio. Welcome to AP Daily Review number seven. It's Mr. Mons here coming to you live from beautiful Tiffin Columbian High School on Tiffin's beautiful South Side. Hopefully you have been enjoying the videos so far. And today we are going to do the second part of natural selection. So again, get some pencils out, right? Settle in, grab yourself a snack because we're going to be working our way through the second part of natural selection. So let's just always do a warm up. You know, it's always important you to get those brain cells going. And so in this review, we're gonna be looking at the following topics and skills. Again, common ancestry, 7.7. We're gonna look at phylogeny, one of my favorite things. We're gonna talk about pipe cleaner cladograms. Uh, topic 7.10, speciation, 7.12, variations of populations. And of course, task verbs using FRQs. And again, we're gonna be talking about the last two types of FRQs you have to write. So I hope you're ready to go. I am, and let's kind of uh, talk more about natural selection and specifically common ancestry and speciation. All right, so in my previous video, I talked about the first four task verbs. Now we're gonna talk about the last three. Represent, right? If something is gonna represent, you're gonna use a graph, a symbol, a word, an illustration, something that's gonna kind of a table or numerical value to describe a concept, a characteristic or a relationship. State, simply stating often asks you to state the null or alternative hypothesis. If you're not familiar with the null or alternative hypothesis, I would encourage you to look that up or ask your teacher. It's really important that you have the ability to state a null and you state an alternative. And which, when you do this, you indicate or provide a hypothesis to support or defend a claim about a testable question. Supporting a claim, my last one, provide reasoning to explain how evidence supports or qualifies a claim. So these are our last three um, task verbs, represent, state, and support a claim. And again, my questions that I'm asking you may not exactly line up with these task verbs, but it's always good practice just to go back and review them. So topic 7.7, .7, common ancestry. Some of the highlights with this one are structural evidence indicates common ancestry for all eukaryotes. And so it's really important understanding how like you've learned all this stuff through all the units, unit one and two and three, but how does all of this evidence indicate common ancestry for all eukaryotes? And as always, refer to AP Daily 7.7 .7 for more detailed information. So there's our little check mark. That's, that's the important part here. So let's look at an example. It's always important to look at examples. So in terms of common ancestry, you have to understand the mitochondria and the chloroplast and how they are related and how they provide this evidence for common ancestry. So membrane bound organelles, such as the chloroplast and the mitochondria, which I have on the screen for you, do provide structural evidence for common ancestry of all eukaryotes. And some of the things they have is that the chloroplast and mitochondria have double membrane, they contain their own circular genome, they contain their own ribosomes, and all of this together, you may see this term called endosymbiotic theory. And so the endosymbiotic theory is some of the strongest evidence we have for common ancestry. And so I think it's really important that if you've not seen this term before, you go back and look at this topic video 7.7. .7. But the fact that these two organelles share such common similarities, such common structures would indicate a strong common ancestry. So let's kind of build on this by let's do some practice here. So topic 7.7, .7, this is argumentation. This is one of those task verbs. You gotta, you gotta make an argument. You've gotta make a prediction. So a researcher uses the protocol shown in figure one to isolate a eukaryotic gene for the purpose of genetically engineering recombinant bacteria that will synthesize the eukaryotic gene. So there's our information. There's our picture. We've got our cell, we've got a specific gene, we've got the plasmid, and then we ultimately have that recombinant. Which of the following best predicts? Here's a prediction again, all right? You have to take all this information and think about what may happen. This is your task for it. Predicts the result of the bacteria failing to, re -up, to uptake the recombinant plasmid. So we got the bacteria will synthesize the eukaryotic gene. We have an enzyme there that cuts the DNA and the fragment with the gene is inserted into the plasmid. And then you have these bacterial cells with the eukaryotic gene are cloned. So this is showing you the process. The question is asking you to predict what happens if, um, if it fails to do that. So it's not taking it up. So A, the bacteria cell will stop producing bacterial proteins. B, the bacterial cell will produce eukaryotic genes using the bacterial chromosome. C, the bacterial cell will not produce the eukaryotic genes. Or D, the bacterial cell will produce its own enzymes to synthesize eukaryotic gene. So again, read the question, write down an answer, A, B, C, D. I'm gonna pretend my students are here, jot down your answers, and let's see what we got. A is not a good answer. The bacterial cell will stop producing bacterial proteins. It's already producing bacterial proteins. The fact is, is you're putting this recombinant plasmid in that has part of the eukaryotic. Not a good answer. B, the bacterial cell will produce eukaryotic genes using the bacterial chromosome. Well, if it hasn't retake, if it hasn't up to the recombinant plasmid, hasn't incorporated it, it's not gonna produce that gene. 
Or D, the bacterial produces own enzymes to synthesize eukaryotic gene. It just doesn't, can't just switch these genes on to make this eukaryotic gene. So your best answer is C, the bacterial cell will not produce eukaryotic genes because it has not incorporated that recombinant DNA or that recombinant plasmid. So the best answer there is C. And how does this tie back to common ancestry? The fact that bacteria, right, or that we can take these recombinant plasmids, put these plasmids in, put these sections of DNA in, and these bacteria are able to produce eukaryotic proteins indicates common ancestry. So that's kind of how you make the argumentation. But again, on this prediction, what's not going to happen? So let's talk about phylogeny. And so phylogeny, phylogenetic trees and cladograms are some of my favorite things. I've got my uh, pipe cleaners here. I'm going to show you here in a second how to use those. But phylogenetic trees and cladograms, how they show evolutionary relationships among lineages. Here's the misconception. It's really not a misconception, but I think it's a challenge is that interpreting cladograms. And so as always, refer to 7.9 phylogeny. Watch the AP Daily. Do the progress checks. I cannot say that enough. Practice makes perfect. Maybe not perfect, but pretty good. So let's look at an example. So let me show you this first. So I've got some pipe cleaners here. So each one of these pipe cleaners would represent a different lineage, right? On a tree, on a phylogenetic tree, right? And so this down here would be the common ancestor. So if we think about this for a long time, these are all common ancestors. And then something happens where there's a change in the environment or some kind of event occurs. And this orange, right, part of the tree breaks off or doesn't break off, but splits up. Then we have a period of time now where these lineages stay together. And then for some reason, right, something changes the environment, right? The yellow and the black break off. And I'm gonna kind of twist these a little bit because so they may have branched off and they're gonna stick together for a while and then they're gonna form their own little branch. Then for a period of time, we have some more stable environment and then something happens and this white one starts to, right? It, diverges. And then we are going to twist again. We've got some common ancestry going on. And then this red one, whatever this may represent, branches off. And then we're going to twist again, the purple and the green, periods of time, lots of stable environment, and then they branch off. So when you think of a phylogenetic tree, you really need to think of like almost like a three-dimensional that this right here, this trunk represents all a common ancestor, right? And then over a period of time, due to changes in the environment, natural selection occurring, whatever, they branch off. And the one thing I, you really need to understand is that these things can rotate around, right? I'm going to talk about that. So kind of when you're thinking about this, you know, maybe you got some pipe cleaners at home, make yourself a little phylogenetic tree, right? Um, and kind of see, but these are how these represent branching off long periods, uh, you know, common ancestry, and then these nodes are branching off and each node would represent a speciation event, but then you have your roots. So there you go. So going back to the slide, a phylogenetic tree is a branch diagram showing the evolutionary relationship among species. A cladogram is a diagram used to show evolutionary relationships among species. So when you're looking at either a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram, there's a couple of terms I wanna point out. One is the root, right? So here's the root of this one. And then you have a node, and the node is this branch here. So that node represents a divergence event there, right? And so that's kind of important. If we look down here, I, what I've circled there, I've, I'm circling a couple groups there. I'm going to go back to this one. D and E, right? So you've got a node, right? They've branched off. I've circled uh, B, C, D, and E. They all go back to that common ancestor. So there we have that group there, and we have that group there. So that you, you could look at these graphs in multiple ways and we could ask you, identify a common ancestor, describe the process that these occurred in, explain how to create a cladogram or explain what a phylogenetic tree shows. But the one thing I do wanna point out is this idea of monophyletic, where I have that arrow around, around D and E, that represents a monophyletic group, mono meaning one. So when they, if they ask you about a monophyletic group, it is these two species and their common ancestor, mono meaning one. So let's do a little practice here with phylogeny. So construction of phylogenetic tree and cladograms can include morphological similarities from living or fossil species or DNA and protein sequence similarities. So in this case, the number of amino acid differences, make sure you read those titles in cytochrome C among five species. So as we see, I always look for the one that has like the largest number. So there is 21 differences. And again, I apologize to all my anthropologists out there that I'm probably gonna mess up these words. E. ferris and D. 
polylepsis. I tried to practice them, it didn't work. So I noticed they've got 21 differences. So that means that they're probably farthest away. Then I look for the next set of differences, 20 between D polyepsis and E africanus. Okay, so I got these two differences. I got to construct this chart. So they're probably far away from each other. But then, so I'm going to put D polyepsis on that very end. All right, I know that it, it is farthest away from these two. So I'm going to put this on the very end of my tree or my, yeah, my tree here. Then I'm gonna look, okay, these two have three differences. So they must be close together. So A forest I and G gallus. So those are probably on the same branch, right? I'm gonna put those in the middle because there are three, but I know the biggest differences are 21 and 20. And so I look at that one, hmm, E africanus and E ferris only have one difference. So they have to be really close together. So I'd put them, whoops, I, we got a little too crazy there. I would put them on that same branch. And so this is kind of how you would go about creating a phylogenetic tree is kind of looking where are the greatest differences, where are the similarities, and kind of placing it in there. But remember, these nodes can rotate. They can, they, they can rotate around. So there's a little bit of flexibility sometimes in your placements. Now I'm going to move on to the next slide because I got a little bit too excited. I really like phylogenetic trees. I made my model. So let's do a little practice because practice is always awesome and important. Sk skill is visual representation, which we've done several times. You're going to construct a cladogram to represent a model of the evolutionary relatedness among the bear species based on the differences in the LYST protein sequences, table one. Circle the position on the cladogram that represents the outgroup. Construct, okay, that's my task. That's what's what I have to do. So my uh, science practice, I gotta use a visual representation. I gotta construct a cladogram. So that means I'm gonna have to put organisms on those ends of those branches. Then I'm gonna circle the position of the outgroup. I should have told you previously that the outgroup is the one that's kind of off by itself. It's the one that tends to have the most differences. So if I look at table one, right, I know I got to construct and I know I got to circle. So those are my two things that I have to do. Well, again, I'm looking at that panda column, black, brown, polar bear, 33, 34, 40. Those are lots of differences. If I look at black, brown, right, one and one, seven, eight. So that probably is a giveaway that my panda is my outgroup. But then I look at the black and brown bear, they only have one difference. And then between the black bear and the polar bear is seven. So I know my panda is my outgroup. That's going to be the very first one. That's the outgroup. Um, so I'm going to construct that cladogram by placing my outgroup first. I know the black and the brown bear have one difference between each other. So I'm going to put the black bear and the brown bear there. Remember, right, the rotation of those nodes. And then I'll place my polar bear there. So I've constructed my cladogram. All right, that was my first thing. Check mark, did the construction cladogram. It's showing that relationship. Now I have to circle the outgroup. Well, if you remember previously, the outgroup is the one that has the most differences. So I'm gonna circle the panda. So again, if you're struggling with these, pause, do it on your own, practice it, look for some um, practice questions, ask your teacher for some practice questions as well. But constructing a cladogram, don't let it like cause you any unneeded stress. So let's, let's practice a little, another one. Five, again, this is visual representation. So again, you're gonna to have to look at a picture and you're gonna to have to base an answer based on an image. Five new species of bacteria were discovered in Antarctic ice core samples and the nucleotide sequence of rRNA subunits were determined for the new species. The table below shows the number of nucleotide differences between the species. So I've got species one through five. I've got my nucleotide differences going across the top. Which of the following phylogenetic trees is most consistent with the data? So which one of these trees, A, B, C, or D, is most consistent with the data? So again, I'm going to go back and look at my tree, or excuse me, my, my table there. Well, I'm looking for the one. All right, that's kind of a giveaway. So three and four, there are only one difference. I'm going to look at my options there. Pause the video. Talk to your friends. Which one do you think it is? We've got to find the one that has three and four the most commonly related. Well, it, we got it there on C. They're right on the same branch or branching off from the same node. And A, if we look at B, B is not an option because if we look at uh, species three and four, they're kind of far away from each other. If we look at D, three and four, again, kind of far away from each other. So they should really be kind of on that same branch. So we're going to cross that off coming off from that same node, excuse me, keep saying branch, but it's the same node. So now we look at A and C, okay, we got three and four, three and four, but we have some other data. So I'm gonna look, okay, if I look at species one and two, they have three differences between each other. And then the rest of them are like 19, 27, 26. So now I need to go look at my uh, chart there and see which one has one and two most closely related. Well, it's not A because if we look at A, it actually has five and one more closely related. So the best answer there is C. I put a little star there on the node, the common ancestor. C is the correct answer. So C would be most consistent with the data. If you got it right, congratulations, gold star all around. Great job. 
then we got another one, visual representations. The reason why I'm spending so much time on these uh, cladograms and phylogenetic trees and those is because they are a skill that I have found that my students struggle with and that talking to other teachers, students struggle with. So mammalian milk, and this is an FRQ, mammalian milk contains antibodies that are produced by the mother's immune system and passed on to the offspring during feeding. Mammalian milk also contains a sugar, lactose, and may contain proteins, protein A, protein B, and casein, as indicated in the table. So there's your table, milk components. I've got character, lactose, protein A, protein B, casein, cat, cow, horse, pig. Those pluses, make sure you read that. Pluses means they have it, right? A minus means they do not or indicates that the absence of the character. So using the data in the table, construct a cladogram on the template provided to indicate the most likely evolutionary relationship among the different mammals, indicate on the cladogram where each of the character most likely arose in the evolutionary process, and justify the placement of characters in the cladogram. Three things you have to do there. Three skills, three tasks for, excuse me, the skills, visual representation, but three tasks you have to do. So you got to construct indicate and justify. And as you can see here, off to the right, you have a cladogram. So construct, indicate, and justify. So here is, I pause the video because here, here are your responses here. So again, using the data, construct a cladogram on the template provided to indicate the most evolu likely evolutionary relationship among different mammals, indicate in the cladogram where each of the character most likely arose. So you have two options here. We've got the one on the left, you've got, you're getting one point for the placement of the animals, cow, pig, horse, cat, human. If you don't know how I got that, pause the video, go back. And as you can see on the other one, cow, pig, horse, cat, human, right? So the placement properly on there. And then, so we're not quite done with our construction yet, right? So there's our um, organisms. And then we have to place the uh, proteins. So we've got lactose A, case and protein B can be placed there, or on this one, they could have lactose case and protein A and B there, or loss of both casein and protein B. So maybe that characteristic or that trait was lost. So again, we got to construct the cladogram, indicate where those characters most likely arose. So there's the indication part. So again, we did the construction, right? We listed them. You indicated where they most likely arose by placing them on there. There's your construction and there's your indicate. Now let's go to our justification point. So again, I did not put the justification uh, question on there, but you had to justify the placement. So for that first cladogram that we saw, the justification is lack, you had to justify the um, placement of those characters. Lactose and protein A arose in a common ancestor to all five animals. Protein B and casein arose only in the common ancestor of the pig, cow, horse, clade branch. And so the reason why lactose and protein A are kind of by themselves, they're a common ancestor of all five. All five possessed it. Casein and protein B were only present in the cow, pig, and the horse. And so that's the justification for that first cladogram. So there's our animals again, our organisms. There's our placement. There's your placement. And then again, this justification. Next one, if you created a cladogram like this one, again, construct, indicate, justify. There's our cow, pig, horse, cat, human. You've already gotten that point previously, right? Here's our placement, lactose casein, protein A, protein B, loss of both casein and protein B. So in this justification, lactose casein, protein A, and protein B arose in a common ancestor, all five, place them there. But then you could also put protein B and casein were lost in the common ancestor, the cat, human, clade branch. So again, when you're describing these, these cladograms, by saying the loss of is still accurate. So you would have got the justification point for that. So again, I'm gonna put my arrows there so you can kind of see where they're at. So again, I'm gonna take a deep breath here. If you're still struggling with the cladograms, you know, go back, watch the video for topic 7.9. These are a very important part of this unit because by creating a cladogram or phylogenetic tree, but as you can see, it's been mostly cladogram in, in this review, you have to look at the vis you have to look at the visual data they give you. You have to think back on previous knowledge. So again, really strongly suggest looking over the cladogram and watching 7.9. All right, moving on. Hope you guys are doing all right. Topic 7.9. 10710 is speciation. And so when we talk about speciation, I have my, I have two animals here. I've got a lion and a tiger, right? Different species. Now, if we were to, you know, create a uh, phylogenetic tree at some point, there'd be a common ancestor, but these represent two different species, all right? 
tiger, and a lion. All right. So highlights. Speciation occurs when populations are reproductively isolated from each other and different ecological conditions impact the rate of evolution speciation. So we talk about speciation, right? If organisms cannot successfully reproduce, that can lead to isolation, that can lead to speciation. So again, always, as I'm going to say in all of these videos, refer back to 7.10710 for more detailed information if you're struggling. So let's look at an example. So speciation refers to formation of new species. These are some blue-footed boobies that you would see on the islands of the Galapagos. You may have talked about these if you talked about Darwin in class. And speciation results in diversity of life forms. Diversity is important. The more diverse, the more stable. But reproductive isolation is critical for speciation. If two organisms cannot reproduce and produce fertile offspring, right, can lead to isolation. And so there's two types of barriers, right? Prezygotic before fertilization, postzygotic barriers after fertilization. So again, I can see a question. Explain how prezygotic barriers lead to speciation or um, those kind of things. So prezygotic pre before, postzygotic after. And so when we talk about speciation, and again, why I'm spending a little bit more time on this is because I think at least in my experience, students struggle. So there you have your area of land, you've got trees, some kind of event occurs, right? If you have sympatric speciation, sim means literally like same country, right? That's reproductive isolation. So sympatric, right? Reproductive isolation, for whatever reason, those trees in the middle, they're not able to um, reproduce with each other. Allopatric, geographic uh, isolation, different country, there's been a separation there. And so again, looking at a, a possible question, you know, explain how allopatric speciation leads to whatever. So trying to see how they can use these tasks. But in speciation, right, for whatever reason, reproduction cannot occur, cannot produce fertile offspring, and that can lead to new species. So allopatric, again, refers to evolution new species due to individuals from the same population being geographically isolated, Sympatric refers to evolution new species due to being reproductively. So if we look at geographic, we look at reproductive, here's my insects, right, whatever. There's a river that's separating them, that would be allopatric. So if you look on that uh, left side or with the red, there tends to be, be more with the red phenotype as opposed to the other side of the river, we have more of the black and the white phenotype, right? That would lead to speciation. On the bottom, there's some kind of reproductive isolation. Maybe they don't recognize each other's uh, coloration patterns or something. But again, speciation is key for this. Uh, uh, for speciation to occur, you have to have some kind of separation so that they cannot reproduce and produce for a offspring. So again, and we're also talking about speciation. I'm going to talk about two terms, punctuated equilibrium, which is this evolution occurs after a long period of stasis, stasis being um, calm or the environment's not changing very rapidly. And then you have this sudden change and bah, pow, you have all these, uh, you have this rapid evolution of, of these organisms where gradualism slowly over hundreds of thousands of million years. So again, I think it's important that you're able to identify the types of speciation and the difference between a punctuated equilibrium and gradualism. So let's practice. So here we have topic 7.10, explain relationships. This would be an example of an FRQ. And so in 1981, a single immature male, Geospis conistris finch, sorry for the scientific name, flew more than 100 kilometers from the Galapagos Island of Espanola to the Galapagos Island of Daphne Major, where no species of this finch were living. The immigrant finch bred with a female G. fortis, a species of finch common on Daphne Major. The F1 finches in the later generations interbred only within their lineage, so how they were breeding. By 2012, scientists counted 2,323 individuals, that's a lot of birds, including eight breeding pairs within this hybrid lineage on Daphne Major. The hybrid lineage became known as Big Bird. So <laughs> birds with different Beak shapes and sizes eat different types of food. The dimensions of the big bird beaks, say that three times, relative to the beaks of, of the major competitor finch species on Daphne Major were shown in figure one. So there we have a graph. Again, you're explaining relationships. We got beak depth. You've got beak length. You've got the different types of species of finch. And you got big birds. So this one, there's some data that you're going to have to um, interpret. So figure one, the dimensions of the birds of the big bird lineage and of its major competitor species in 2012 on Daphne Major, each symbol represents the beak dimensions of a single bird. So again, read the captions, apply it to the graph. So this is a FRQ. So there's several parts. A, 
the big bird lineage became reproductively isolated from G. fortis. Describe one prezygotic mechanism that likely contributed to the reproductive isolation of the big bird lineage from G. fortis. There's that term describe, right? Describe a prezygotic mechanism. I didn't list them for you, but hope you have to come in with a certain amount of knowledge. Okay, so I know prezygotic. Part B, based on the data in figure one, explain, explain why the big bird population has been able to survive and reproduce on Daphne Major. So part A is asking you to describe one of these barriers. B is explaining how did this, right? How were these birds able to survive and reproduce on Daphne Major? So you might want to pause the video here, write down some options because I'm going to give you the answers in a little bit. Again, part C and D, this was a four part question. In part C, a virus infects and kills all of that species of finch on Daphne Major, but does not affect the other finch species. Assuming food type and availability stay the same, predict, here's a prediction, gotta take this information, right? The most likely change in the beak phenotype of the big bird population after six more generations. So we got a prediction there, okay. Again, you're telling a story, A, B, C, and then part D, kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, the end of the story, provide reasoning to justify your prediction in part C. So you got A, B, C, D. So pause the video. Hopefully you're jotting down your answers. Maybe not, but let's look what we got here. So for part A, describe one prezygotic mechanism that likely contributed to the reproductive isolation of the big bird lineage, beak size or shape, song or behavior. You could have put mechanical, chemical differences, time of mating or location on the island. Any prezygotic mechanism would be acceptable describing, you know, the beak shape or size, whatever changed the time at which they ate, which limit, which uh, kind of affected when they could mate, or there wasn't enough food to mate, thing along those lines. So any description of a prezygotic mechanism, I just listed several of them there. So um, I took these from AP Classroom. And so knowing that you don't have to have like that entire process, you need to have one description. Part B, explain why, again, why the big bird population has been able to survive and reproduce. All right. Well, we, here's, a, here's a great explanation. Big birds have a beak size that differs from beaks of their competitor finches, and therefore they, there's no competition. That's the key. They do not compete with other finch species for food, so, but instead eat food that the other finches do not consume. This idea of, we're thinking about natural selection, like, wait, less competition, right? Big bird population has been able to survive and reproduce because they're able to get those resources needed to do those two things. So there's A, there's our explanation. C, you now have this disruption, all right? We've got this virus, it's killing off these other finches. Assuming food type and availability stay the same, predict the most likely change in the beak phenotype of big, big bird population after six more generations. Well, you got a couple options here. You could say prediction one, the, be, the mean beak size will increase in population. Prediction two, the average beak in the population will be longer and deeper. Prediction three, the frequency of large beaks will increase in the population. As long as you make a prediction that's feasible and scientific, uh, that can be you know tested scientifically or is accurate, you know us as a reader we would have to accept it. So looking at our prediction, I need to justify. So provide. So again, in this part D, you need to provide reason to justify your prediction in part C. So in part C, you had these prediction one, prediction two, prediction three. So justification for predictions one, two, and three, there will be directional selection for larger beaks because larger seeds are more accessible. So anything. Your justification, as long as it matches your prediction, should be fine. All right, so hopefully that argumentation, as you can see, these are FRQs. I would pause the video and then make sure that you've met all those requirements there. All right, here's another one. So a lot of reading, so just bear with me. Um, so this is a parasitic fly, and I'm not going to say the scientific name because I'm going to probably say it wrong, and is a parasitic fly in North America that infests fruit trees. The female flies lay their eggs and the eggs hatch and grow through the developing fruit. The next year, the adult fly, flies emerge. Prior to the European colonization of North America, the major host of Rileyatus was a native species of hawthorn, Crataegus marshali. I'm gonna try that one. The domestic apple tree, Malus domestica, is not native to North America, but was imported by European settlers in the late 1700s and early 1800s. When apple trees were first imported in North America, there was no evidence that Ragolati could use them as a host. Apples set fruit earlier in the season and develop faster, where hawthorns set later and develop more slowly. So the idea was that these uh, one type of tree was ripening at a different time than the other tree. And so when trees ripen, when fruit ripen, they can provide food for organisms. Recent analysis of the ragolized population shown that the two distinct populations of flies have evolved from the original ancestral population of flies that were parasitic on hawthorns. One population infests only apple trees and the other infests only hawthorns. 
The life cycle of both populations were coordinated with those of their host trees. The flies of each population apparently can distinguish and select mates with similar host preferences and reject mates from populations specific to the other host trees. There is little hybridization, only about 5% between the two groups. That's a lot of reading. You may want to pause it, reread it yourself. I know I did not say those uh, scientific names correctly, but trying to get through this, so be gentle. Anyways, so here's our question. The divergence between the two populations of Rhygolitis must have occurred very rapidly because, now this is a because question, argumentation, okay, why did this happen? We got A, the apple tree was important in North America with European settlements approximately 200 years ago. B, flies were important in North America with European settlements approximately 200 years ago. C, long distance rail transport of fruits increased only after the American Civil War. Or D, heavy use of gunpowder during the American Civil War led to increased mutation rates in many natural populations of plants and animals. Pause the video, reread the question, right? Then decide like, okay, is it A, B, C, or D? There's a lot of information going on in this question. I'm gonna point out a couple of things though. Prior to the Europeans colonization of North America, these apple trees, Malus domestica is not native to North America, so it wasn't here before. And there was no evidence that, that evidence that Ragulettus could use them as a host. And so, as we go through this question, two distinct populations of flies have evolved. So here's the key point. You had some common ancestry due to changes in the environment, probably the presence of a new tree. Two populations, right, have evolved, have split. So can distinguish. And so that's the idea is that you can see differences. Here's the thing, divergence, they're separating. So part, so A, the apple tree was important in North America with European settlements approximately 200 years ago. B, flies are important in North America with European settlements. C, long distance rail transport of fruit increased only after, North after, the, after the American Civil War. Or D, heavy use of gunpowder during the American Civil War led to increased mutation rates. Well, it's not going to be B, flies are important in North America with European settlements. There's no reference to that. The flies were here. Uh, long distance rail transport of fruit increased only after the American Civil War. Well, we know that they were brought in before then. Heavy use of gunpowder during the Civil War led to increased mutation rates. There's no reference to that. The best answer is A, the apple tree was important in North America with European settlement approximately 200 years ago. And when that apple tree was imported, right, it provided a new food source, which allowed for that divergence to occur. That was a long question to read. So again, that one, you may want to go back and pause and reread it because there's a lot of information in there. All right, so kind of moving on to topic 7. 12 variations of populations. So the highlights in this case are that the level of variation of population affects population dynamics. And as always, we refer to AP Daily 7.12 for more detailed information. There's a little check mark. So far, so good. All right, so let's look at an example. So the level of variation of population affects population dynamics. So variation refers to different combination of alleles, genotypes, and phenotypes found in population. Variation is important. Variation is the driving force for natural selection. So by having variations in populations allows for new species or for speciation to occur. So results from random mutations during, if you've watched a previous video and we talked about uh, DNA replication, crossing over during meiosis and populations with little genetic diversity are risk of extinction. So if you have a very small gene pool, often uh, they do not, uh, they cannot bounce back very quickly from an environmental response or environmental distress. So again, random mutations crossing over are two, one of the major driving forces for variation. And again, we're talking about variation. Genetic diversity is key for survival. So here's an example of variation populations. Not all individuals in a diverse population are susceptible to a disease outbreak. So here is some antibiotic resistance. Right, these are some you could talk about in mutations, and we talk about variation. So, I have my original population, I've got the normal bacteria, and I got that little blue one. Well, what may happen is so there's our blue one. Maybe we apply an antibiotic, and an antibiotic is taken, or we apply it to petri dish or whatnot, and all of those bacteria die. So, the ones that die are, are the ones with the little X's on them. But those blue ones can kind of kind of linger. So those blue ones are left. They have the variation, right? So they're, they're, they have whatever variation makes them so that they are not susceptible to that antibiotic. And so they're going to be able to survive and reproduce. So again, this could be a great question. Describe how antibiotic resistance may occur or explain why the resistant bacteria's population increased. But over time, right, the blue bacteria, right, that's in that circle there may also, you know, become more more common, and it may also pick up other uh, variations or mutations, and you know can maybe 
possibly become another species down the road. That's why I have that from blue to green. So again, this is just another example um, of how variations populations um, can develop. And so I think bacteria are an easy example. Another way variations of populations can occur is that alleles are adaptive in one environment condition may be um, not so good in another. And so if we look at the picture, we got a shared phenotype is uh, deleterious when sand is slightly covered. You may have done an activity or, 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 or something with you had different types of mice, color of mice, dark mice, light mice on a different type of substrate, right? The selective pressure of the environment determines whether the trait is an advantage or disadvantage. So as you can see over time on that top one, right, depending on, so we've got these gray mice, you've got the black mice, and over time, the, the black mice, their alleles may be removed from the gene pool because of uh, you know, predator or something. On the bottom, the shaded phenotype is an adaptive trait when the sand is darkly colored. So again, let's say you have a volcanic eruption occurs. And so the substrate changes, right? And so area that was sandy is now dark black. And so those uh, organisms with the shaded phenotype, right, are going to do much, are not going to do as well as the darkly colored. So this is just showing you how a variation can be advantage, which can lead to a change in the allele frequency, which can lead to speciation. And so that's just kind of giving you an example of how variations in populations can lead to one trait being favored and another one not being favored. So let's practice. So leucine aminopeptase laps are found in all living organisms and have been associated with response to aquatic muscles, myelitis, illis to change in salinity. Laps are enzymes that remove N-terminal amino acids from proteins and free amino acids in the cytosol. To investigate the evolution of laps in wild populations of M. edulis, researchers sampled adult mussels from several different locations along a part of the Northeast coast of the United States, as shown in figure one. The researchers then determined the percent of individuals possessing a particular lap allele, lap 94, in mussels from each sample site, table one. So if we look at this, we've got table one, percent of individuals possessing the allele. You have figure one, which is sampling sites of marine mussels at various locations one through eight in Long Island Sound, Atlantic Ocean. So across the top, we see site, frequency, salinity, Long Island Sound, Atlantic. So again, making sure you read the table and reading the uh, caption underneath. So marine mussel larvae are evenly dispersed throughout the study area by water movement. As larvae mature, they attach to rocks in the water. Scientists claim that mussel populations will increase in high salinity water, provide reason to justify the claim by connecting evidence with biological theories. So this is argumentation. Right, so you're gonna have to justify something. And scientists claim that muscle populations will increase in high salinity water. Why this is like a evolution, uh, natural selection, all of this kind of question is because they're talking about these populations will increase in high salinity water. You have a different environment. So some organisms are gonna be better adapted for that environment than others. So again, this may be a place to pause the video right before I give you the answer, try to write your justification. I'm gonna point out a couple things here though. There's a change in salinity, which means a change in the environment. Right, you have these free amino acids in the cytosol. This is tying it back to another unit, right? If you're changing the amino acids in the cytosol, you're going to be changing, you know, you're going to be changing the osmolarity possibly. So there's our data. As we're going from frequency 37, 55, you get to the ocean 59, 59, 59, you're seeing an increase in that allele, right? So that, that allele is becoming more common. So if we look at your justification, muscles with the lap allele are more likely to survive in high saline environments because the allele encode, encodes cellular activities that prevent water loss in marine environments. So as you can see, if you look at that blue box I have between Long Island Sound and Atlantic Ocean, those organisms without a lap allele, they're going to survive in high saline environments, right? Because if you look at the salinity, it's going from low to high. Because they have an allele, there's your genetics, that encodes cell activities. That goes back to that free, free amino acids in the cytosol that prevent that water loss, right? So there are lots of different units in this question, this justification. So again, when you're doing these FRQs, argumentation, if you get to a justify, you, you just kind of have to like – pull from every unit. And so in this one, I can think of at least two or three. So anyways, that would be the justification there for this argumentation. All right, what should we take away? Takeaways again, as always, review the suggested AP daily videos. I went through and mentioned those as I always do. Go back and review, take those progress checks, practice FRQs and focus on your task verbs. Do not cram, have a plan. These videos are gonna be released in April. You'll still have plenty of time to study. And as always, ATP answer the prompt. But I'm gonna, as I did in my other videos, I'm gonna talk about the last two FRQs. So FRQ5 is a free response question, analyze a model or visual representation. So you're gonna analyze, you're gonna to have to look at a model, right? 
analyze it, and then or a visual representation, which we did. It's a four-point question that presents students with a description of an authentic scenario accompanied by a visual model uh, or representation. The question assesses your ability to do the four following things. A, describe characteristics of a biological concept, process, or model represented visually. You're going to have to look at the model and analyze it. That's what it says. Describe characteristics of a concept or model represented visually. You're going to have to explain. There you go. Explain how. Explain why relationships between different characteristics of a concept or process are represented visually. So you're going to describe a characteristic. Then you're going to look for relationships there. So there's probably going to be at least two or three things going on in that question. Part C, represent relationship within a biological model. So you're going to have to look at that model presented, and you're going to look at some relationships. It might be cellular, right? It may be a relationship between how something is transported in and out of a cell. In part D, explain how a biological concept or process represented visually. So again, FRQ5, you're looking, you're going to be given a visual model, or you're going to have to analyze a model, you have to describe a characteristic, explain, represent, and explain. So as you can see, and these are the FRQs that you get towards the end of the exam. So you've already gone through one, two, three, and four. So again, describe, explain, represent. So kind of knowing what you're up against. And then, of course, the last FRQ, FRQ6. Free response question six is analyze data. It's a four-point question that presents students with data in a graph, table, or visual representation. And this question assesses the students' ability to do the following in four question parts. Part A, just describe data. You're looking for trends, right? Part B, describe data again, right? So they may be giving you two data sets, or they're going to ask you, describe what's going on in figure one or, or, or table one, so on and so forth. Part C, use data to evaluate a hypothesis or a prediction. And part D, explain how experimental results relate to biological principles, concepts, processes, or theories. So again, as we get towards the end, at last FRQ, data, data, it's all about the data. So again, not, you know, in those progress checks or ask your teachers, just being able to practice these FRQs is very important because again, the FRQs are 50% of the exam. So again, coming up, your last unit will be Unit 8 Ecology with Margaret Evans. Um, again, she's always awesome and amazing. And so again, um, hopefully you've uh, worked your way through all seven and then you get to eight. So again, I just want to thank you um, to all you AP teachers working hard, to you AP students for watching these videos. I know at times the content is very heavy. It's a lot of text to read. You know, Colombian right here, Mr. Monsoor doesn't always say scientific names correctly, but the big idea is this is just kind of give you a taste of what to expect. Again, you've worked so hard, go back, do the progress checks, watch the videos, and, and just do your best on your test. That's all it can be asked. So again, this is Mr. Monsoor signing off from beautiful room 102 on uh, Tiffins, uh, Ohio, Tiffins beautiful south side. Um, again, good luck. Keep it classy, AP Bio, and I'll see you in the future.